Hello and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of History and the 25th Annual American Indian Heritage Celebration. Our presenter, Kay Richardson Oxendine, will begin in just a moment. We want to share a few notes with you. Remember to ask questions in the chat and we'll do our best to respond to them and share them with our presenter. We have many additional resources about American Indians in North Carolina on our website, nc-aihc.com. We thank the following sponsors of the North Carolina Museum of History Foundation, helping to make this event possible. Now, let's get started. Welcome, Kay. Ms. Oxendine is a member of the Halawa Saponi tribe, and she's the author of the Pow Wow Pocket Guide, everything you wanted to know when visiting a powwow but were afraid to ask. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I wish all of you were here as well, but because of the current circumstances, this is what we need to do. Um, as she stated, my name is Kay Oxendine, Kay Richardson Oxendine, and I'm here to talk about the history of North Carolina powwows. Now, I have in front of me, which I'll be reverting back to many times, um, a variety of music. And all of this is relevant to our talk today and our discussion, because without music, of course, we would not have a powwow. I'm actually going to start really quick just by playing one song. Um, that is an inner tribal, and this is by a group called Thunder Voice. <laughs> I miss the powwow so much. We have been jonesing in North Carolina and all over the East Coast. I'm sure everyone is. You know, we've not been able to powwow and get together. And, um, you know, for those of you who don't know what a powwow is, a powwow is actually a way for Indian people to express our Indianness. Many of us go to work during the week, have different jobs, and on the weekends, we hit the powwow trail. Uh, where we actually um, travel to different communities and sing on our drum and, and dance in our regalia, not our costume, in our regalias, and really honor those um, people that may not be able to dance, also our ancestors and things of that nature. The way the powwows began in North Carolina was during the 1960s, during the Jim Crow South. Many of the government in our area decided they were trying to do away with our Indian schools. They wanted to integrate us into public and different schools of that nature. And so they did away with our community schools. And, you know, this created an urgency for many of our elders and, and people in the community realizing without our Indian schools, a lot of our things that we would be teaching our children may be lost. So hence the powwow began. The Halawasa Pony were the first ones who began in 1965, and um, that powwow was more like a few hours of coming together. I believe there were one or two dancers. Willis James was one of them, and Theodos Lynch was another, and one or two may have played the drum as well. Um, so it was very small, and it was just a matter of bringing everybody together in the community to celebrate our culture. This is actually footage or a picture from... An earlier powwow, probably in the 70s, this picture was either taken um, probably by my father, Ed Richardson. But this is an actual canoe dance. Um, 
the canoe dance was actually brought to the Halawasa Pony by uh, Clifton Holmes from the Chickahominy tribe. And um, he was instrumental in really helping us forge in the very beginning by teaching us those type of dances. Um, one thing that we also would find in the beginning would have been the smoking of the peace pipe. This was really more for show for the audience, um, but it was um, something that the chief at that time, WR, enjoyed doing, and I believe we stopped it you know, a few years back, um, just because their powwows just began to be so much more. Um, but after we started our powwow in the 60s, um, the Lumbee people followed that in 1968. And along that the way, there were people in different communities that really began to come together and form different groups. Um, one of those people that was so instrumental in getting something started was Joe Lyles, who is a non-native person, but he traveled all over the West and sang on many different drum groups and was very highly respected. And he is probably more welcome than uh, most people that I know at any drum in the area because of his knowledge. Um, but Joe got together with Mike Clark, who was Ray Little Turtle's brother. And um, they decided to form, um, this is a picture of Joe Lyles, Mr. Joe Lyles. He's also a Southern straight dancer, and he's the co-founder of Southern Sons Drum. But he got together with Mike Clark, and they decided to form a group called Lumbian Friends, and that was in the late 60s. And why that's important is because um, they actually were given songs by Ponca members out of Oklahoma. And the Ponca people were very proud of that fact that they actually gave a song to the Lumbee people. And as far as we know, that has never been recorded. And the Poncas, if anybody has a recording of that song that was written for the Lumbee, they would love to have it so they can keep it in their record. Part of the Ponca's history is their gifting to other people. And so that's really part of their history as well. But they wrote that song and came over to North Carolina and gifted that song and, and shared many other songs with the people in Lumbee and Friends. Now, that was a group, like I stated, that started in the late 60s. And they met in Raleigh. And what they found was that people were aching to just learn more about the powwow singing and things of that nature. And so it really grew from there. It was native and non-native people that came together to form the powerhouse Lumbee and Friends. And that was the name of the drum group, drum group and singing group. Um, you know, Ray Little Turtle, who was essential in this community as far as getting so many things done. Ray was a uh, an incredible MC. He was an awesome leader. This picture here on my right, might be your left, but um, this is actually a picture of when he was at my powwow, Halawasaponi powwow in the late seven or early 70s. And this is, of course, him in his glory there. If it hadn't been for Ray, many of us never, ever, ever would have been able to MC. He was incredible. He was quoted at that time to state we had a stigma of not being BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, recognized. So all of this powwow stuff comes in to fight that stigma. We saw powwows as one way we could all come together and tell the locals about our Indianness. So that was really important to all of us at that time. Now, the second or the third person, should I say, after that that came was the Kahari people. The Kahari people had their powwow in 1969. And a, a good memory from that was Barry Richardson, who also is a leader in the Halawasa Pony community, stated that that was his first powwow that he was actually able to travel to. And it was awesome to go there and see other Indians in their community. Um, he said there was a lot of other things going on, people jumping from airplanes, people doing all kinds of things. It was more like a show. He said, but what he remembers was just being able to go there and feel that feeling. And many of you know what I'm talking about. When you go to a powwow, you know you're at home. You know that you have arrived. Um, but he also remembers it was his first time he ever ate, ate out in a restaurant. And it was owned by another American Indian, Dobbs Oxendine. 
And he never forgot that because as a young boy, he said that was very inspiring to him to know that another American Indian could own such a thing as a restaurant. So that was a really good treat for him. Um, one thing that always happens at powwows is that we crown heir princesses. And now I believe we have several um, men that are getting in and doing the warrior and Mr. You know, all these wonderful things about the royalty, but this is all part of our culture as well and honoring our people so that they can go out and represent our tribes in doing so. Now, after Mr. Clifton Holmes did come to the Halawasa Pony, we had the gift of Arnold Richardson, who was also Halawasa Pony. He moved back to the community from New York. And when he did, he taught the Plains way of dancing to us. Um, and he was instrumental in really bringing a whole different light to that. With him also came the drum group he created, Shallow Water. From Shallow Water, there was Whitetail. From Whitetail, there were many, many, many other drum groups that came. Um, so he was instrumental in really making a lot of things happen in our, in our um, community and to our youth. I also have a picture of Mr. Archie Lynch, who was an icon, is still an icon in our community, along with Miss April Whittemore Locklear. At the time, she was Miss Indian USA. And so um, what you find is that we all become family, regardless of what tribe we're from. Um, the Waccamaw Suwon came in 1971. That was when they had their first powwow, along with the Lumbee Homecoming powwow. Now, the Lumbee Homecoming powwow was um, really, Joe Lyles talks about this. And he was with uh, Lumbee and friends, and he said he wasn't sure how it was going to start because they were having Lumbee Homecoming. And any of you ever been to Lumbee Homecoming, it's massive. But this was the first one. So they took a drum into the center and they just started playing this drum and they did not know what was going to happen because all of this was still very new to the people in this community. And he was so pleased to have people just come out and they were drawn. You all know what that feels like when you are drawn to that drum. The, the power of the drum will bring you in and you just want to dance. You just want to be a part of that. And so he knew that it was successful. Joe Lyles, of course, went on to be the founder, as I stated, to Southern Sons. And um, actually, I have one of their CDs here as well. I'm going to play that really quickly. Um, just a, a one song on here to let you know. This is um, a Southern drum group and you'll notice it's a different style than what we heard from Thunder Voice. Thunder Voice was a northern more contemporary sound where very high pitched um, but our southern singers they have a, a lower a lower pitch to them so interesting in that song um, with any of the songs you have someone who leads and then it's like a call and then all the other singers come in behind that call it's called seconds but in that one they had kind of a, a call and response which was pretty awesome in, in hearing that but that's a southern style 
Um, Joe Lyles and people like Derek Lowry really were instrumental in, in bringing this type of sound and keeping it here in this area. And then we had so many other drum groups. Stony Creek. Stony Creek merged together from several different drum groups. They um, started off with Young Society and some of the white tail guys from Hollow Ossipony that came after Shallow Water from Arnold. Um, many of them came together and formed Stony Creek, and they were members of um, Hollow Ossipony, Lumbee, Wakamasu on Kahari, and Tuscarora members. And so it was really the first joint. Um, drum groups such as that, and they've been able to travel the world. I actually was their manager for a number of years, and it was really funny. Um, this is how everything began, okay, with cassettes. This was Stony Creek's first tape, and as I was doing my research, you know, it was just uh, ironic. I'm, I'm looking here, and it says, for bookings, call Kay Insing, which was um, me in a, a former life, but... <laughs> <laughs> My telephone number and everything is on it, which is so crazy because, you know, today we have the Internet. We didn't have all that back then. So you had to call me if you wanted to book these guys. But because I was a little older, it allowed uh, Stony Creek to really travel. Um, you know, I was a, about 10 years older than most of the people on the drum. And so they were able to, to go many places, and it did take them many places. This was actually their first plane ride. They went to Skimitzen. And they, they were number 36 at Skimitzen. Skimitzen was the biggest. I've never been to a pile like that before, and I probably never will. But here we have member uh, Dwayne Harris and Marty and EJ. EJ no longer sings with the drum, but he's still family. But you all know Marty as Dr. Marty Richardson now. Um, but... Marty, if you'll notice one thing again, I want to show about Dwayne. He has this C like that. A lot of people think that's because it's Stony Creek. But really, we called the C was because everywhere Marty went, he was holding a cassette player and recording someone. And if he wasn't recording them, he was listening to the song. <coughs> Excuse me one moment, please. I'm so sorry. So we actually got that. Um, this was famous. To, anytime you went around, you would see so many of the drummers holding these cassette tapes. And um, that's how they were able to bring some of those songs to us. Now, practice was such a big deal during that time because we would actually practice in our houses. This is a picture of actual practice happening with Colton O. Juniors inside my living room. It happened every Sunday. And this is how so many of the songs got shared. And again, they were recorded on these CDs. And this is actually called Practice Colton O. Juniors. And these songs were passed down to all of those people who were not able to make it to the powwow. So it's really important that they were um, able to, to share that. Once the Waccamaw Sioux one started, I did want to share that the powwow began to share very, um, power became very important in communicating the presence of the Waccamaw to a much larger audience than ever before possible. And it assumed a crucial role as a marker of, of Waccamaw identity. Powwow shape identi individual social identity, promote inter-tribal unity in action to interact with and support the most important traditional values of family, community, heritage, and parentage. Thus, these gatherings, while new in terms to appeals to plain style dancing and singing, also strengthen long-standing traditions and practices that had existed outside of the powwow complex. So along with all of these powwows that were getting started in our tribal communities, um, there were powwows in the urban areas that were also joining together um, different communities. In the Charlotte area, Metrolana Native American Organization was founded in 1976. They had their first powwow in 1983. 
it was a, a place where Indians who were in the city could go and still be a part of their culture. And that was in 1983. Uh, in Guilford, which was Greensboro, they also had their first powwow in 1986. Now, the Tuscaroras had their first powwow in Maxton, North Carolina in 1980. And what you would have found at their powwow along with everything else, you would have probably seen some smoke dancing. These are actual Coltano Society dancers. And this is in 1988 at the Maxton powwow. So you would have seen, a, you know, a Iroquois style dancing, which was, you know, traditional for that for that uh, particular area and, and still in this region as well. <clears throat> the Cherokees actually had their first powwow in um, 1975. Now, I have a jewel here. Now, this is how we used to produce C <laughs> CDs. <laughs> their name was Ahawa Awahale. This was a Cherokee CD, and this is how they distributed. This is how we distributed our songs. I mean, this was done from 530.02. I'm just going to play one thing. This is from our Cherokee brothers, okay? Will Tusk and them guys are going to kill me for this, but it's so awesome. Let's do a crow hop. Let's see what that sounds like from our Cherokee brothers, okay? <clears throat> Awesome. Just an idea. You know, all of these drum groups, again, when you travel with the music, what it did, it, it just connected everybody together in such a way that it just didn't matter. And um, one thing, whenever you went to a powwow, the one thing you would always have is food. Now, if many of you go to the Lumbee powwow, you know that you cannot leave without getting a collard sandwich. And a collard sandwich is some collard stuffed in between two pieces of fried cornbread with fat back on the top. And if you're lucky, you'll get a little thing of chow chow on the side. And it is to die for. It is delectable, along with some grape ice cream. So food is really important at every powwow. And we begin to realize the importance of having that <clears throat> and really knowing um, everything together would make that powwow so special. Um, the Okanichi of the Saponi Nation had their first powwow in 1985. Now, this is a picture of the now chief of the Okanichi of the Saponi Nation. When they began their powwows in 1985, they were known as the Eno Okanichi tribe, but they changed their name later on um, and became a state recognized with Okanichi of the Saponi Nation. This is, uh, many of you know, uh, Chief John Jeffries, John Blackfeather Jeffries. He was instrumental also in becoming an MC and just really taking your culture on the road to so many different places. Um, <clears throat> so we're very thankful for that. The Maharans um, had their first powwow. And um, I have a picture of an, one of my friends from the Maharan in 1988. I realize I had this picture the other day. This is for Julian. This is Julian Hunter's dad. Andrew Hunter. Um, he was such a dear friend of mine, a wonderful person here. Incredible jury maker. He was a friend to all of us. And he passed away at a very early age. And I was so thankful when Julian and his brother came up and just kept it in the family because what a gift. 
Many of you also know Patrick Suarez from the Meharan. He is such an ambassador for his people. I wanted to include him as well um, because I know that this year they were able to have a virtual powwow, um, which was so fantastic. It made all of us so happy that he was able to do that. So the Meharans um, were able to have their first powwow in 1988, and Fayetteville actually had powwows along the way and they stopped and then a, in a group called Running Water which is from the Fayetteville area started um, a powwow together in 2009 and they've been going strong since that time and we're very thankful for that because you know in between Lumbee and, and Hollister is you know that we just needed something in between that way. Um, one thing about our culture you, that everybody does learn is that our kids are our future. So we always bring our children in as soon as they're able to walk. With my son, he listened to the power music all of the time while I was pregnant. <clears throat> I spoke earlier about Southern Sons and about Derek Lottery, and he was a very instrumental in helping groups like Southern Sons stay, you know, um, really keep their focus on making a good song. He wrote, uh, good dancers were a dime a dozen, but good singers weren't, especially in the early days. Most of us didn't know a lot of singing, so we just did the best we could. And a lot of times we just muddled through. Those 30-minute breaks that were standard part of the powwows here, they started partly because the MCs were worried that no one knew enough songs to get through to the end of the dance without running out. And he didn't really have a good knowledge of family songs. But the first question people would always ask about a dance is who's singing? So we knew that becoming good singers was part of our goal. And so, as I stated earlier, you know, because of all of these things, you know, that we went from, you know, our CDs and our tapes to our CDs and our CDs began again, like Awahalis with the writing like this to growing to Stony Creek singers, brother to brother. But if you open up the CD, you see we're making progress, but we're not there yet, okay? So you see, <laughs> you know, we're still putting them out there, and that's what's really important. And then we get to the another version of that, and you see where now they progress to having everything printed. So it's a matter of keeping it all together and making sure that regardless of what avenue you're able to hear it, that... Um, you know, that you still are able to enjoy it. Now, round dances are part of our culture as well, and these come from songs on the hand drum. Um, let's see. I'm kind of afraid to put this CD in because you never know what I'm going to hear, but um, let me see. This is um, hand drum songs from John Wesley Oxendine. Let's see. Let's do 10. Let's do 10. This is called Warm and Cozy Heart. She don't want me no more She's locked me outside of her Why? Because he hard But she doesn't know She's got me forever Forever faithfully Okay, so that's hand drum, and I held this up because these are round dances that may be sung with the hand drum songs. This is Sonora Lynch. Many of you may know her. Um, she's um, an accomplished potter and artist, 
And this was her in the early 70s doing what she does best, just being there with their kids in the community. And this is what we call a two-step, also, which would be saying possibly to hand drum song. So all of this music is so important as we go through our powwow. Get this one out. <clears throat> Now, all of these are connected in such a way because, like I stated, this tape here of Stony Creek was recorded by the lead singer of Cedar Tree Singers, okay? And C Cedar Tree is more of a southern drum group, but they lived in the northern Virginia area at the time and were able to record this for the group. And so you see how everything comes across. He even has a song on here called John Oxendine's Song. Now, that's unusual. Usually, they do not put such a, a thing on a CD, but that's just letting you know, again, how important it is to label those songs. Well, a lot of our um, educational systems came into the mix after about the 80s, and they started having powwows on campuses of UNCP, UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, all of them have their own powwow and air powwow season in North Carolina begins the third weekend in April with air powwow, the hollow Pony powwow, but the college trail begins late February and ends before the third weekend in April. And that will be all of the powwows in between North Carolina and Virginia. And, you know, really all of us are so connected in all of these States in, in here in the Southeast because Many of you know that we didn't right, we didn't put the borders in place. The government put the borders in place. We still consider all of us family. And so if you, even though I'm Hollow Pony, I can still walk into the Chickahominy community and still be very accepted and, and know that I'm among family. I would be remiss not to remind everyone of the importance of our women, our leaders. I found this photo and then this photo here, there's a picture of people like Miss Pat and, and Miss Lucy Jane Chavis, um, who really just knocked down doors to make so many things happen. Um, also, people like Miss Rosa Winfrey and Miss Ruth Revels that just, just broke down so many barriers to be sure that women had a voice at the table. We always have. We just had to push men out of the side to let them know that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, this is Coltono Juniors, which is another group that formed off of Stony Creek. This is um, showing the importance of our women singers, our backup singers. <clears throat> it's nothing like the chorus of hearing those women come in in seconds. It is so powerful. Now, as I said before, you know, I think... Stony Creek was really the first group to travel outside of the realm of being on North Carolina powwow circuit. And with that brought many other things where they were able to be a part of different movie sets. This is actually from The Broken Chain and, of course, Rodney Grant. He was from Dancing with Wolves. But what it did, it just allowed the groups in this area to be more recognized. There was an actual movie, The Broken Chain, that came to Virginia, and I happened to be the casting director, and I was able to give an opportunity to a lot of, not me, but the, the company was able to give a, lot, a big opportunity to a lot of young Indian people and really make a difference. And um, that's what it has done to really bring this forth. forth. And um, in the beginning, I played a CD from... Thunder Boys, and why that is important was that one of the singers on this was Care Little Turtle. Now, Ray was such an incredible asset to us, Ray Little Turtle. I believe I showed his picture a little earlier, but Care Little Turtle was actually brought up in the circle, not knowing any difference whatsoever. Um, you know, these are just pictures of different inner tribals that we have been able to go to over the years. And Air Powwow Circuit is so thick and it's got so much family in it. Um, it's just an amazing part of that we've been missing tremendously, obviously, with COVID. 
and everything that's been happening with um, that. You know, it's been a real loss for us not to be able to share with their family. Um, you know, when COVID hit, you know, we were not able to have, we had our winter powwow in January because that was really before anything was, was taken or we knew the significance of it. But then came um, March and by April we had to cancel our powwow, which was just, I tell you, I woke up that day and it, and it was a, such a feeling in the community that um, we felt like we just lost someone. It was horrific. And so we're all praying that COVID does find a cure, that we get a vaccine. And so we can all join together again on the powwow drill very, very soon. And um, all of these songs here, all of this music here is related um, because somehow they have a connection to North Carolina. And I have Silver Cloud here. Um, who is a group from the New York area, but uh, my friend Kevin Tarrant was one of the first victims of COVID. I want to recognize him because tremendous loss to the Powerball community that a lead singer of a drum group was taken by COVID. So why don't you just mention that today, you know, because all of this is still going to be part of the history once we're all said and done with things. And um, before I do end, I just wanted to let people know that I use many sources today. And this is a list of the sources that I did use. A lot of the pictures were taken either by my father, Ed Richardson, or myself, or borrowed from someone. Um, but I did everything with permission. And um, I hope I have a few questions along the way. And um, it has just been an absolute pleasure to share this with you. Thank you so much, Kay. I am learning so much and it makes me want to go out and see more powwows. And I really understand better now how powwows came about in more contemporary times, but they reflect the heritage and traditions and cultures of Native peoples. And they help kind of cement it and knit those communities together stronger. Yes. Um, and yet they're so welcoming to non-Native peoples. If you're ever and everybody attending today should make an effort when powwows are open again to go yes. out and visit them. Absolutely. We do have some questions for you. People want to know if there's a source for all these groups and CDs you've mentioned in case they're interested in, in obtaining that music. Um, I would do, um, Google is wonderful. I would go and type in Native American music. There's a lot of um, groups that are on YouTube that actually have the CD, you know, the people performing, and that's a, a great tool there. Um, but also go on Facebook and just, you know, you know how to do the Google game. You, you type a few things in and just keep on going. You can type in North Carolina drum groups. You can type in anything like that, and that will hopefully satisfy what you're looking for. I know that here at the museum at the American Indian Heritage Celebration for 25 years, Stony Creek has participated. And for most of those years, um, Southern Sun has as well, which yep. I know are two groups you're intimately familiar with. Um, also, people want to know about your book. So the stories, the history, the images you're sharing today, are they available in your book? Um, actually, my book is really just type. I mean, you know, I, I wrote a very, the book came about because I, I went to the NC State powwow with some friends and they were non-native and they asked me a gazillion questions and and I found myself just talking and talking and talking and there was a woman sitting behind me going, gosh, you should write a book. And I said, you're right, I should. And I went up to Joe Lyles, who was a dear friend of mine, and said, Joe, I'm going to write a book. So everybody knows. He goes, do it, Kay, you're great at that. And it took me two days and it was published <laughs> because, you know, it really is, you know, if you don't know, you don't know. And it was simple things like one of my girlfriend was like, where do I sit? You know, she, she, she came in and she was like, she was intimidated by the sound of the drum. She goes, can I go buy that stuff? Yes, please go buy that stuff. <laughs> you know, but if people don't know, they don't know. And so I found much success with the book and being able to help people understand how to feel when they walked in the door. Right. So my understanding is that powwows are very welcoming, but at the same time, there's an etiquette of honor and respect. Yes. And I know that you discussed that as well. Um, and that extends to regalia. Is that something that uh, Native peoples wear every day? No, we only wear regalia when we're in ceremony or when we're at powwows. And um, when we are 
out in the public, we wear regular clothes because that's who we are. But when we practice our culture, we do don our regalia. A lot of our regalia is either handmade by ourselves or our family or passed down from generation to generation. And a lot of the regalia are very sacred. So if you are able to see someone in a regalia, I would encourage you not just to walk up and touch their regalia because some things may be very sacred on them. But ask permission. Most natives are very welcoming. Sometimes a person may not be that is not across the board, but if someone is, respect that as well because it is, you know, their own. Um, you know, <clears throat> we don't always know, and I just want to talk about this for a second, just like if an eagle feather drops. If you're at a powwow and an eagle feather drops, it means something is happening. Usually it happens because a family member has died or there may be something happening in that person's life. Um, there have been so many, and I kid you not, I'm getting chills thinking about it because every time I've been at a powwow and an eagle feather has fallen off of someone's regalia, they will come back and say, my father died this morning. My brother just was in an accident. We don't always know those things. And that's why I say to people, don't always assume you know what's going on. Um, a lot of times, if something like that happens, the powwow will come, will come to a complete stop. Everything will stop. And we will go through the process of honoring that situation and picking up that feather. And if that dancer at that time wants to speak about that, they're welcome to do so, but they do not have to. OK, so situations like that is up to the MC to explain what's happening um, when a, uh, something like that happens, even though we encourage pictures all during the powwow. At that point, we will say, please turn all cameras off because some it, it's sacred is it, when the ceremony enters and the powwow kind of stops where well, we have to take the time to honor that that situation. And I think that's true across cultures. We need to be respectful of all cultures, all traditions. Um, no matter what the culture is. And so, again, powwows are warm, welcoming places, but we need to uh, be aware that if, you know, if you're fortunate enough to attend one, you it'll be, um, I think it's fairly easy to understand. Um, it's sometimes, frankly, common sense just to show respect and kindness. To That's right. Peoples. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you. For being with us, for your who you are and what you do. Thank for you. For all of us and for sharing with everyone here. Um, and remember that um, all the events of the North Carolina American Indian Heritage Celebration, this is our 25th anniversary year. I'm really glad we could persevere and continue the celebration this year. Um, they are all going to be available as videos on the North Carolina Museum of History's YouTube channel. We hope you will check that out and that you will check out all the resources we have available um, with at nc aihc Dot com. Thank you again, Ms. Oxendine, and we look forward to seeing everybody again in person. Absolutely. We'll see you on the trail, people, soon, soon. Thank you.